All right, um, so the important stuff here. Um, so first thing to note, so my office is across the hall. It's room 239. Um, you will be forgiven for mistaking it for a janitor's closet um, because it is small and it is messy. Um, <clears throat> I am there Monday through Thursday between 10 and 12, right? Uh, now that's when I have to be there. Those aren't the only times that I can be there. And you know, office hours are for you, right? They're not for me to do my own work. They're for you to come and ask me questions or get help with assignments or whatever, right? So I you know, never feel when you go to, to a professor's office hours like you're bothering them, right? It's part of our job. Um, and I do hope that some of you will take it, that all of you will take advantage of this and will, you know, will come and have questions for me. Um, so if you are busy, between 10 and 12, Monday through Thursday, but you need to meet with me about something, right? Let me know and we can arrange another time, right? I can do scheduled appointments too. Um, the other thing that everybody should note, right? So do not ever try to attempt to, uh, attempt to contact me using the Georgia View email widget, right? I don't check it um, because frankly, the Georgia View email is a pain in the ass. Um, just email me directly, right, just michael.moyer at gsw, and I promise if it's a weekday, I will get back to you within 24 hours. If it's a weekend, I might take a little bit longer to respond, but yeah, generally, but you know, not that much longer, right? So I will always try to get back to you within 24 hours. Um, okay, so uh, there are four textbooks that you need for this class. I think I sent everybody an email about these. Over break, yes? Everybody got that? Great. Um, so these are all available in the bookstore, although I realize that you might not have received your financial aid disbursement yet. So if you haven't and you need the financial aid to buy the textbooks, let me know at the end of class and you know if we need to, I can PDF something for you uh, for our next session, right? But yeah, the first two books you're gonna need, the ones we're gonna need right away, are this one, Writing Analytically, which is our rhetoric textbook. We're gonna be working with this for about the first third of the semester, and then we'll come back to it when we start writing the research paper at the end of the term. And this book, um, the Reacting to the Past, Rousseau, Burke, and the French Revolution, 1791. Now, what this book contains um, are documents related to an educational role-playing game we're gonna be playing sort of towards the, like shortly after midterm, right? When each of you are gonna be assigned parts of historical figures, and you're gonna be participating in debates as those historical figures, right? And you know, writing argumentative articles about um, issues in the French Revolution. Um, but we're also gonna be using this in some early writing assignments, um, in part so you get familiar with the material before you have to do any of that, right? So. I'll always put the home, like the homework is on the syllabus, right? But I'll always put what I expect you to do for next time on the board as well at the beginning of class over on this side. So for Tuesday, you're gonna read the first chapter of writing analytically. There are two writing exercises you're gonna do, uh, short exercises, which we'll do some practice for today. And you're also gonna do a short 500 word piece um, you'll find the instructions on pages 36 and 37, and you're going to use the Declaration, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, which you'll find in this book, as your subject for these assignments, right? So all of the material that you need for these assignments you'll pick from this short piece, right? Um, any questions about texts so far? All right, so like I said, all of the, like I checked, all of these are, Thank God, all of these are actually available in the bookstore now. I know we've had some snafus with this in the past, um, but we're all good now. Yay. Okay. And like I said, if you're not gonna be able to get the textbooks by next week, let me know and I'll get, I'll get you something, okay? All right, in terms of assignments, right? So, these try this exercises, these short writing exercises, filed under homework, 
these are on, going to be worth about 10% of your grade, right? So you're going to do five sets of these. They'll each be worth two points. The assignments at the end of the, of the chapter, right, these were filing under informal writing assignments. They're also worth 10%. You're going to do five of these. They'll be worth two points each. The articles you'll have to write for the reacting game will be worth 25% of your grade, right, 25 points total. You're going to write two papers, right, the first is going to be a close reading with no research of one of these two books that we'll be reading later in the semester. And the second is going to be a research paper that is going to grow out of the reacting sessions, right? So you'll pick some topic in the French Revolution, you'll be writing an argumentative paper about that with sources, right? The last element of your grade, the last 10 points, um, are participation. So participation involves showing up, it involves being attentive, it involves asking questions, right? Speaking up when I ask questions. Um, and it can also involve things like just like doing extra stuff for the class, right? So if you come and talk to me during office hours, that's participation. If you go to the writing center to you know, work with a tutor on an assignment, right? That's participation. If you um, schedule a session with the research librarian to help you find sources for the research paper, right? All that stuff is participation. Um, so, right, all of that stuff counts and will up your participation grade, right? Okay, so any questions about what you're getting graded on? Everything pretty clear? Everything good? Okay. Right. Okay, so in terms of our policies here. So there is an attendance policy, right? Um, you do need to be here, um, especially as we get into the reacting stuff, right? That's gonna be heavily dependent on people showing up. Um, so <clears throat> you're permitted three unexcused absences, right? Think of these as being like sick days at your job, right? You get three, Bringing me an excuse doesn't get you more, right? It's nice to know why you're out, but you still only get those three absences. Now, if you are aware of something that is gonna keep you out of class for a time, and tell me in advance, right? Or if you have a, you know, a genuine long running medical issue, right? You know, come talk to me and we'll work something out. But in general, Right, three absences is the limit. Right, so don't use the videos as a substitute for coming to class. Because for one thing, if you're just watching the videos, you're not getting participation points, right? Okay, um, health and safety stuff. Okay, so um, we're just gonna be following what the basic CDC guidelines are now, right? Which is, um, if you test positive for COVID, you isolate from the first day you show symptoms to day five, right? Day six, you can come back to class, you can be around people again, but you gotta wear a mask. After day 10, you can be around other people unmasked, right? Um, let's see, let's see, okay, uh, disability accommodations. Um, so, if you have a diagnosed disability that require certain classroom accommodations, you don't tell me about it, right? You don't talk to me about it. You go to the third floor of Sanford Hall, because of, por of course we put the disability office on the third floor because that's what we do, um, <clears throat> and talk to Evelyn Oliver, right? And what she'll do is send me a form. She won't tell me what your disability is because that's none of my goddamn business, right? but she will tell me what accommodations you require. And you will, you know, I'll, I'll fill in the form, I'll sign the form, I'll send it back to her, you'll get those accommodations, right? But, and we never have to have an awkward conversation about it. 
Um, okay, writing center. Does everybody know where the writing center is? Okay, how many of you have used the writing center before? <laughs> All right, but you know where it is, okay. So that's the first step, right? So those of you who don't know where it is, it's in the library. Right, you just go all the way back into the left from the, the front doors, right? Um, and they do accept walk-ins, even though they prefer you to make an appointment online. Um, and I do give extra credit on paper one and paper two if you go to the writing center, right? So please do that. Please take advantage of that. Um, okay, I did promise to explain uh, the whole cell phone thing here, right? So um, I promise that when I'm making you silence and put away your phones, like I'm not being arbitrary and I'm not just being a dick, right? There's solid neuroscience research that says that if our phones are in our field of vision, they are a distraction, even if we're not interacting with them. So what I'm trying to do here is minimize distractions so that you're fully present in the room and getting as much out of the class as you can, right? And I found that not only do more students pass the course since I instituted this rule, I get better work out of you and average grades have been higher, right? So whatever effect this has, it seems to be working. So this is why I do this, right? It's just kind of to you know, give you 75 minutes where you're not worried about what's going on out there and you're just concerned with what's going on in here, right? Okay, so does, does anybody have any questions about this? Everything is more or less clear? Okay, then um, I guess the last thing we really need to cover here is the academic dishonesty policy. Okay. So, when we talk about academic dishonesty, so what sorts of things constitute academic dishonesty, right? Um, plagiarism. Okay, yeah, plagiarism, right? So, plagiarism is the big one. And what do we usually mean when we, when we say plagiarism? What, what, are we, what are we typically talking about? Sorry, a little louder, sorry. Yeah, when you're taking someone else's work, right, and trying to pass it off as your own. Now, there are a couple of ways people do this, right? One is to have someone else write the paper for you, right? Whether it's your friend, or whether you're buying it from a you know you know a paper mill right some you know, somebody online who sells term papers right um, another thing that people often do is just you know cut and paste shit from the internet right which is easier to detect than people think it is because sentence structures and language types are inconsistent right and the paper often looks kind of incoherent. Now, one of the dirty little secrets of the online paper writing industry, if you buy a paper from somebody, do you think they're going to sit down and read the assignment and think very carefully about it before they send it back to you? They're just cutting and pasting shit from the internet too, right? So you're paying them good money to give you back something that your instructor is probably going to detect as plagiarism anyway, right? So don't waste your money, right? <clears throat> it's easier and safer to just write the paper yourself. And we've got plenty of resources on this campus to help you, right? You know, there's the Writing Center. I'm happy to help you. And I'm sure, you know, you know you'll be working with some of your classmates on some of this stuff as well, right? So there'll be plenty of support and you won't need to do this. Now, another thing that people don't often, don't always realize is plagiarism or is dishonest, is to try to turn the same paper in for two or more different classes without informing the instructors that's what you're doing and getting their permission, right? 
So if you want to use the same paper for more than one class, you need to make sure that you get permission to do that from all instructors affected, right? Because when you do this, the paper will actually turn up as 100% plagiarized in Turnitin because it's already in the system for someone else's class, right? So this is something you gotta be real careful about. Um, now, in terms of what the penalties are for academic dishonesty. So, in this class, the first offense is going to result in a grade of zero on the assignment, and I'm going to send a report to the student conduct office, right? Because frankly, I just got tired of giving people second chances and getting burned again. Um, if you get three notices like this in the student conduct office, you're suspended. So, right, don't do this, right? If you, play, if you are caught plagiarizing a second time, then you automatically fail the course, right? So those are the rules. Now, th this almost never happens, right? And I'm sure that this is not going to happen with any of you. But I just want to lay out what the rules are, right? Just so everybody's aware of the consequences. All right, uh, last thing I need to talk about here, Title IX stuff, and I'm sure your other instructors have covered this too, but if you report to me that you have been a victim of sex-based harassment or discrimination, um, I am not allowed legally to keep that secret, right? I have to tell our university Title IX co uh, coordinator it's required by law. Um, so this doesn't mean don't tell me things if you think I can help you. But it does mean that if you do tell me things, I can't just keep it between us, right? It's, you know, it's against the law for me to do so. Okay, so any questions about classroom policies, assignments, any of this shit? We're all good? Okay, so I would like to start today then by sweeping some of the cobwebs out of our brains. Um, and I'd like you to take, say, seven minutes, and I want you, just take out a piece of paper and a pen, and I want you to recollect what kind of work you have done in other English classes, right? Just, you know, write, you know, you know take seven minutes, write, say, a paragraph, on what you've done in other English classes you've taken, whether in college or in high school, okay? And then when you're done, we're gonna read them.
two more minutes. Okay, so what have you all got? Who wants to start? Yeah, Zakaya. In, in my first English class, taken in college, I've done multiple things. I've written a rhetorical analysis for an article chosen by me. I've written a personal narrative that was mostly research-based. Mm -hmm. I've, I've created and designed infographic with a persuasive and entertaining insight. Lastly, I read a research paper based off my infographic. Okay, that's that's a lot. <laughs> who, who did you have for uh, comp one? Miss um, Sassy. Okay. All right, cool. Who um, who wants to go next? Yeah, Ariel. In my comp one class, I had constructed a magazine with the topics traveling relationships and paper, where we just dissected the individual topics and then made a paper the following topics correspond with one another. Mm -hmm. In another English class, we wrote a paper about a character from the film, The Greatest Showman, of how they correspond with us as individuals and what their meaning and values mean to us. Okay, cool. And was it The Greatest Showman thing, was that in high school or was that here? That was in high school. That was in high school? Okay, so it was like, yeah, like a, like a character analysis. Basically. All right, excellent. Yes, Michaela. Fantastic. All right. So it sounds like, like some of you have already done some research papers before, so this might not be quite as scary for you at the end of the term as it might otherwise be. Excellent. All right. Next, Shakela. You were in the same class that she was? Okay. And last but not least, go ahead, Colby. My exploits with higher level English courses began in the 10th grade where I took Comp 1 online at South Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. I passed the class with a B. Uh, from what I recall, I was a good but not great student. Notably, I wrote an essay that was three pages long on the bus ride to school, and I got an A on it. Uh, 
I took AP language and composition in the 11th grade. This is mm -hmm. the first English class I had that I did not hate. I learned about <laughs> rhetoric and how to use persuasive writing in an argument. I believe I scored a four on the AP exam, but it might have been a three. And then in the 12th grade, I took a British uh, lit class, but that was reading based and not writing based. Okay. So yeah, yeah, but the three or four, that's equivalent to a C or to a C or B in a college course, yeah, so. All right, good. Um, so, what I'd like, yeah, y'all are actually a little bit more advanced than I expected. <laughs> so that's good, right? That's good. So what I would kind of like you to do now is take another maybe five to seven minutes and reflect on these things you did and think about what it, what you were supposed to get from them, right? Like, why did you do these things, right? What did you learn from doing these things? Take two more minutes. And to be clear here too, right, I don't understand why we did these things is a valid answer, right?
So who is willing to speak up first? Yes, Shakela. Okay. So let's try to think about what all of those things add up to then, right? Do you see a particular kind of like theme running through that? Is there something that all those things more or less have in common with each other? Okay. Sure, yeah, you are making the paper better, right? But in what way are you making the paper better? So, so you're learning, you know, a better format, format right? You're learning how to provide citations. You're learning to make better word choices, right? What do those ideas have in common with each other? What do they? What do those things give to your paper, or to your your kind of form of expression? <laughs> okay, so essentially, what like. What, yeah, I'm just going to quickly connect the dots for you here, right? Um, the thing that you learned here was clarity of expression, right? Yeah, which is something important that y'all should be getting out of English classes, right? Okay, who wants to go next? Yes, Michaela. Okay, so I can see two big takeaways there we can pull out of that, right? Um, what do you what do you think the two big takeaways might be from this? It sounds like like your the pattern here is about use of information, right? I think that would kind of go in with the clarity thing that Shaquille was talking about, right? So yeah, structure is important. But think about the research part of this that you were doing. Yeah, okay, so yeah, you're learning how to evaluate information, right? Did you find these sources on your own, or did someone else give them to you? Okay. So yes, you also learned how to do independent research, right? Good. All right, great stuff so far. All right, who's next? Yes, Ariel. Okay, so I think we can see a thread running through this too. There's a pattern here too. Can you see what the connection is between these things? Okay, yeah, and I think that that, that density is coming from a, particular, from a particular place, right? Right, what you're doing is recognizing patterns, right? Right, you're learning to see patterns and weigh and compare information, right? Okay, good. Now, we just got the two of you here, right? Yeah, Colby, go ahead. Uh, from my AP uh, language class, I learned to compose well-written argumentative essays. Uh, mm -hmm. Learning these skills not only helped me to debate at a higher level, but also helped me to notice when the strategies were being used on me. Uh, for example, I now know when to point out at hominem attacks, straw man arguments, mm -hmm. and true Scotsman fallacies during political debates and speeches. 
I love that. No true Scotsman. That's uh, that, that, that's my favorite logical fallacy. Yes. Um, okay. So, what do you, what do you think your big takeaway here is? Then? What's the biggest thing you got out of these classes? Uh, I guess it sort of taught me to both use and recognize uh, just persuasive. Yeah, it taught you how to persuade, right? And also improved your bullshit detector, yeah? And Zakaya. Okay, yeah, so you, you were right. When learning to detect, good, it's just kind of sift good information from bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, like, find, I mean, make sure they have, like, correct citations uh -huh. information. Um, from the personal research, personal narrative, uh -huh. I learned how to, like, compare my, like, my life to, like, mm -hmm. everything else. Okay. Like, with knowing, like, facts about it enough to basically the infographic to a note to persuade uh -huh. people about it, like, or so, they, so that they can learn from personal materials. Okay. So I think the way we might frame that, right, so you're talking about like the, the way that, you know, these things you recognize, you know, have influenced or shaped you, right? So we might frame that as understanding context, right? And, you know, not to kind of like lean too hard on all of this, right? But all of these are super valuable job skills and super valuable life skills, right? Um, the biggest things I want you to get out of taking an English class are maybe a little bit smaller and less specific than this, right? The first thing I want you to understand at the end of this course, right, is that words matter, right? Language matters, the way we frame things matters, right? The way we say something affects the meaning. So for example, if we look at what I started with here on the board here, right, particularly the part about putting your cell phones away. What do you notice about the way I phrased this, right? When you sit down, Please silence and put away all phones and other electronic devices and take a moment to fill out the questionnaire. Thanks for your cooperation. I look forward to working with you. How did I frame this? What's the tone that I'm trying to, that I'm conveying here with these word choices? Um, it, it was very straightforward. Okay. Yeah, I mean like, okay, like there's something I clearly want from you, right? Did I choose an aggressive tone? And did I make a demand of you? Did I say you will do this or else? Yeah, I've said please and thank you, right? So if, if like please was out of it, would that be demanding or no? It might, be, it might make it a little bit less polite, right? Yeah, if you eliminate the please, the statement becomes less polite, or it does change the meaning. It changes the tone, right? Now, why do you think I framed this this way with a please and a thank you and I look forward to working with you rather than just telling you to do this? I don't have to ask you to do this, right? I could just tell you. But then how does that language establish my relationship with you? Like what kind of like what kind of relationship do we then have from the beginning? What's that? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. 
Yeah, like one in which like I'm the authority figure and I'm just going to tell you what to do, right? And I don't care if you like it. Or one where I'm requesting your cooperation, right? You know, asking you to please do something. And what's more likely to make you comply without grumbling about it or getting pissed off? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, but it's more of like a, kind of like a friendly mm -hmm. relationship where yeah. it's like. Yeah, if, if I'm friendly and polite, then you're more likely to voluntarily do what I ask you to do, right? Because like, okay, this guy's not being a jerk about this, right? And, you know, this is, how many of you have said you were nursing majors? Okay, all three of you in the back, right? Um, so... Right, there's this thing called bedside manner that doctors and nurses have to have, right? And so it's going to be very, very important how you frame certain information to patients, right? Like, you know, if you're talking to someone, you know, you're, say, breaking to someone that they have a terminal illness, right? The way, or that their loved one has a terminal illness. The way you handle that conversation, the language you use, is going to have a serious impact on that person's life, right? Yeah, go ahead. I was in the hospital one time, and uh -huh. um, there was this med that they were trying to give me, and mm -hmm. I was telling them that I um, I have a reaction to it, so uh -huh. I have to take like a substitute or something like that. Yeah. And she was just like, um, well, we don't have any substitutes, this is this one for you, so we're just going to have to take this one in. If something happens, you're at the hospital. So, but my mom was there. I mean, uh -huh. I was like a little younger, but my mom was there. Yeah. She was like, no, I, I don't know. I just thought about that when you said that. Yeah. And it was just like, it would have, it would have came off as rude. She would have been like, well, we don't have any substitute. Do you want to try to take this one and see? You know? Mm -hmm. But she was like, you just want to take this. One. Yeah. It's like this is what we got to deal with it, right? Yeah. So, um, what else does that illustrate? The, what else does that interaction? illustrate the importance of what did she not really do to you well if, when you're having a conversation with somebody right what do you generally expect that person is going to do what I, what do i expect all of you were doing to me as i'm talking or doing for me yeah, right? So that's another kind of key soft skill, right? Is learning to listen and to pay attention to what other people are saying, right? Whether you're reading or whether you're just, you know, taking in language through the years, right? So the other big thing that I want you to get from this class or any other English class is what the British poet John Keats called negative capability. Now, I'm going to assume that none of you have heard this term before, that this is not familiar to you. OK. So negative capability is the ability to sit back and think and evaluate a situation before you try to act, right? So instead of trying to deal with something immediately, right, without having processed, you know, your environment, your context, whatever else, whatever, whatever other information you need to deal with, right, if you have negative capability, you're able to hold back and do nothing until you've thought it through, right? So in a lot of ways, what negative capability is, is developing comfort with ambiguity. All right, think about it this way. So, you know, when you are finished with your schooling and you are in a job 
or even, you know, say, you know, in a voting booth or, you know, in some kind of situation with your family, right? Your present family or your future family. How many of the situations that you're dealing with are going to have clear right or wrong, yes or no answers? It is about, yeah, it's about making decisions, right? It's because it's not always going to be obvious, right, in most situations, what the best thing to do is going to be, right? So somebody who has negative capability is able to evaluate the situation and do what they think is best based on the information they have, right? You know, whether it's which candidate to pull the lever for, or to push the button for, right? Or I guess we don't really push a button anymore, right? We have a little stylus and we push down on the screen. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, what school to send your kid to, right? Whether it's, um, you know, um, say, you know, you know a, a complicated situation at work, right? Whether it's, you know, with a, a situation with a coworker or something you've been asked to do that doesn't have clear instructions, right? If this is something that you've learned to do and are already comfortable with, you're going to have an easier time navigating those kinds of situations, right? Okay, so how do we do this sort of thing with language, right? How do we cultivate negative capability in our relationship with language? So let's try to bring these two things together. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that words really have two different kinds of definitions, right? So any word you're looking at has one or more denotations. and also a range of connotations. Um, is anybody familiar with either of these terms? Colby. Uh, <laughs> so like, uh, I might get it mixed up, but denotation is what it literally means, and connotation is what, it, like, what we've been raised to know it as. That's exactly right, yes. Denotation is whatever the dictionary definition is, right? So like if I take a word um, like say rose, right? And I Google it, the, the definition that comes up, you know, a flowering plant with thorns and you know, stem, right? You know, member of the Rowan family, so on and so forth, right? Um, that's the denotation. The connotation is the range of ideas that we associate with that rose, right, with that word. So let's try to pick this apart for a second, right? What kinds of ideas do we associate with a rose? Something you get somebody for like Valentine's Day. Okay, yeah, like it's it's a common love gift, right? Yes, good. What else? What other ideas do we associate with rose that might even be connected to uh, to what Sakaya said? Okay. <laughs> Fragrance, yeah. All right. What else? Decoration. Okay, yeah, decoration, sure. What were you going to say, Ariel? The liveliness of it. Like, okay. how, like, how alive it is or dead. Okay. <laughs> a dead rose has a very different set of connotations than a live one, right? Sure. All right, beauty. And I think sort of as we're kind of in, like, thinking about the whole dead rose thing here, right, you know, maybe to kind of shift gears a little bit. Apart from the pretty petals and the beautiful scent, right, what else does a rose have? What's all up and down the stem? 
Yeah. So it can kind of combines beauty with pain and danger, right? Which is one of the things that makes it such a common and effective image in poetry. Right, that you've got these, you know, it's this kind of ambiguous symbol, right, that can represent all of these different kinds of things. So, in general, you want to try to use language that is more connotative, right? Use words that have a wider range of these kinds of associations, right? Um, we tend to regard this kind of, uh, this contrast, right, as abstract words versus concrete words. So abstract words are words that represent an idea, right? A word that is more abstract is one that is less specific, right, that doesn't give you a particular set of like sensory associations, right? So for example, um, if I give you the words flower and rose, which is more abstract and which is more concrete? Flower is abstract. Yeah, flower is more abstract, right? Because it represents a broader class of things, right? A flower is any flower. It doesn't give you any kind of specific impression. Rose, meanwhile, is a specific type of flower, right? So you want these more specific, more sensory kinds of words, right? In part because these are kind of easier to pull meaning out of. Uh, so when you are reading a piece that someone else has written, you're going to be paying attention to the connotation of words, but you're also going to be looking for patterns, right? So the two major patterns, or the two major kinds of patterns you're going to be looking for are what we call strands and binaries. So a strand is a pattern of repetition. Now it's not exact repetition, right? It's not just the same word appearing over and over again, but it's words that are similar to each other, that are expressing a similar concept. And a binary is a pattern of opposition, right? So you've got words or phrases that are set up against each other, right? This thing is being compared to this other thing. So I want to try a little bit of this uh, with a quote. So the quote I'm calling up here um, is something uh, that was said by the American science fiction writer Isaac Asimov. And the first thing I want you to try to do is pick out words that you think have um, kind of strong, strong connotations, right? And then we'll see if we can fit these into patterns. All right. So. There is, a, there is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there has always been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. All right, so take a minute with this, look at it, and see if you can attach connotation, like strong connotations to any of the words in this uh, quote.
Would it help if I got you started? Okay. So let's look in this first sentence here, the word cult. What's a cult? So I mean, that, that's a pretty broad definition. It could also refer to a religion or a social club or something like that, right? So how do we narrow that definition a little bit to fit like what a cult specifically is? Is a cult typically a large group? Cults are usually small, right? So if we talk about a movie being a cult classic, right? This means it's a movie that is enjoyed by a relatively small number of people, right? But the people who like this movie really, really like this movie, right? So what other, what else can a cult be apart from a small group that has this kind of shared passion or belief? What's the context we usually use the word in? What are we usually talking about when we talk about a cult? Like a shady group of people. Shady in what specific way? Like sort of dark and taboo. So okay, yeah. So we're often talking about people who are kind of crossing the boundaries of what's mainstream, right? And we're often talking about um, small religious groups, right? that are kind of insular, that have, you know, the set of unusual beliefs, right? So when we think about these kinds of things as denotations of cult, right? What kinds of, what are the connotations then, right? What are, what are some of the ideas we associate with cults or with cults, cult behavior? I think you're kind of hinting at some of those here, right? That we tend to be suspicious of them, right? Right, that they're kind of insular, they're not, they keep to themselves, right? We associate kind of fervent or passionate belief with cults. And do we generally refer to groups that we like as cults? Yeah, you generally don't try to deprogram somebody from joining something that you like, right? So yeah, so... <clears throat> yeah, cults are groups that tend to be disliked, right? Okay. So can you find any words in this that we might try to pull some connotations out of as well? literal meaning of nurture. Oh, you're thinking of what like the nature versus nurture debate yeah. in psychology? Okay, so nature versus nurture, right? So what, what's the difference there? If you're, if is you, it nurture like taking care of them or something? Yeah, exactly. To nurture is to take care of someone or something. So what other kind of ideas do we associate with nurture, right? With this particular word for taking care of someone. Okay, mothering, like a mother-child relationship, sure. All right, good. Anything else?
Like protection? Okay, it can be protection, yeah, sure. Right. Protection is certainly kind of part of nurturing, right? And what, what kind of emotion do we associate with nurturing? Yeah, like love and caring, right? Yeah. Which makes this a particularly interesting and weird word to use in this quote, right? So wh where are we for time? It's 4.38. 4.38, okay. Um, so before we get much to let's just kind of pick this back up on Tuesday at the beginning of class um, with uh, kind of what we've done with nurture and cults, right? And we'll continue going through this. But this is the kind of thing that I want you to be doing with the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, right? Go through it and look for these, you know, these strongly connotative words. Look for, um, you know, uh, look for patterns of repetition. Look for contrasts, right? Um, and we'll go over that in class as well on, um, on Tuesday. Um, so last thing, if you are not going to be able to get the books by this weekend, let me know so I can go PDF them tonight, okay? All right, and you are free to go. We'll see you on Tuesday. Have yourselves a good weekend.